dedicated to Eastern and Southern Kentucky. This is WYMT Mountain News This Morning. Good morning. It is 531 on this Thursday, May the 16th. I'm Will Puckett. Thank you for tuning in to Mountain News This Morning. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Brandon. Let's go to you. Yesterday was really nice. Come on nice. over here. Yes, uh, give you a break there to get your cough out there. But yeah, we're going to see conditions this morning that are pretty nice. A little chilly. It was nice yesterday as Will was trying to say there before he, his coughing fit happened. Let's take a look at the cameras and we take a look at Buffalo Mountain this morning and you can see everything's pretty quiet so far. Again, just a little bit of a chill in the air. Satellite radar for the last six hours. A few high clouds. Nothing too major though as we go through the first part of your day. 40s in some of those <laughs> valleys down that way. Monticello, Williamsburg and Harlan all at 48. Jackson, Hazard, Pikeville, and Prestonsburg all in the 50s. Warmest spot in the region right now, London at 55. Several degrees warmer from this time yesterday morning and state temperatures starting to warm up, especially out to the west, almost 60 already in Paducah this morning. Looking at the day planner for today, we'll see sunny skies and then by the afternoon hours, we'll see temperatures in the upper 70s. I have the rest of the forecast coming up here in just a few minutes. We'll you know, I knew that was going to happen. I had a tickle in my throat, and I thought we could toss it over to you soon enough, but no, no cigar. But we'll try this again. Thanks, Brandon. Well, we are down to the wire with less than a week to go until Kentucky's primary election. For those running in the race for governor, three are only a few days left to sway. Their three have only a few days left to sway voters. Minority Leader Rodkey Atkins, Attorney General Andy Bashir, former State Auditor Adam Edlin, and Jeff Young all answered questions in the Kentucky debate. The four candidates talked about pensions, school safety, and paying for higher education. Garrett Weimer wraps up the debate. A number of topics covered in the hour-long debate here. The economy, health care, but none bigger in this state right now, specifically for the next governor to face, and the issue of pensions. Rocky Adkins cited 2013 reforms as making headway on the problem. Keep the reforms that we have in place. Any modifications or adjustments made need to be made with bipartisan support, stakeholders at the table. Andy Bashir listed expanded gaming, medical marijuana, closing corporate tax loopholes, and stopping some tax incentives as ways to create new revenue for pensions. A pension is a promise, and I was raised that when you make a promise, you keep that promise. And folks, I'm the only candidate in this race that will actually give you specifics. Adam Edlin said he'll make sure the pension system is run for the benefit of those getting them. The issue is that teachers paid their 13% every month in, and they were failed by a Frankfurt budget process that failed to do it the same. Jeff Young called for raising taxes on the rich to fund pensions. What we really have is a political problem. Uh, it has to be funded. They also talked about the need to invest more money in public higher education, although there were some differences in how they plan to pay for that. On UK's campus, Garrett Weimer, WKYT. You can find out more about the web, uh, about the debate on our website at WIMT.com. Pensions will certainly be a hot topic leading into Tuesday's gubernatorial primary. Wednesday, House Speaker David Osborne said Governor Bevin still lacks the votes to pass his pension relief proposal. Speaker Osborne told reporters that some House members have not reached a comfort level with the proposal offered by Governor Bevin. Quasi-governmental agencies face increasing pension costs on July 1st unless action is taken. Now, unions representing teachers and school service workers in West Virginia are calling for the upcoming special legislative session on education reform to be canceled. At a news conference yesterday, they said there is no need to spend $35,000 a day to bring lawmakers back to the Capitol. If the plan is to bring back proposals for charter schools and other measures that end with the two-day teacher strike back in February. If the legislative leadership wants to bring up the same old, same old, let's do that in regular session. Let's gov up, glove up, and meet in January and let the bell ring. Don't hide behind these walls in the summertime. How long do we need to wait before we bring these ideas that are utilized in 44 other states in America, the District of Columbia, Guam, and Puerto Rico? How much longer should we allow our students to stay in this uh, environment in which they finish near last? Are they satisfied? I'll ask the question rhetorically. Are they satisfied with near last place performance? A spokeswoman for the West Virginia Senate says that the special session next week is expected to be for fixing bills that were voted during the regular session.
Now, Kentucky's Secretary for Health and Family Services is appealing a judge's decision against the state's abortion law. Last week, we told you a federal judge struck down a 2018 law that banned a common second trimester abortion procedure. Governor Bevin's office said it would appeal the ruling, even taking it to the Supreme Court if necessary. The ACLU filed the lawsuit after Governor Bevin signed the measure last year. The judge ruled it an added obstacle for a woman's right to an abortion. Well, a bipartisan bill co-authored by U.S. Senator Tammy Baldwin would give financial relief to the country's 40 million unpaid family caregivers who tend to an ill, aging, or disabled loved one. And, uh, often our caregivers are unprepared for these roles, and we do uh, far too little, I think, to support them in, um, uh, in what they do. The Credit for Caring Act would create up to a $3,000 non-refundable tax credit to help with out-of-pocket expenses incurred, incurred by caregivers. Hepatitis C kills more Americans than any other infectious disease, and the number of cases is increasing across the U.S. The opioid crisis is mainly to blame. The Hep C epidemic fueled by a needle sharing among drug users. Kristen Holmes travels to Kentucky where health officials are hoping, to, hoping the use of clean drug equipment helps stem the emerging crisis. Kentucky, a state hit hard by the opioid epidemic. I was in New York for 10 years and I've never seen people inject this many times. The use of IV drugs now fueling another crisis. Hepatitis C. If left untreated, the virus can be deadly. Kentucky has the highest incidence of Hep C in the country. Hepatitis C rates have gone up. At seven times the national rate. Officials tackling the problem head on with clean needle exchanges. These open and they put their syringes in when they bring them back. Um, ideally, they're full. Hidden here in the lush rolling hills of Appalachia is the town of Hazard, where the virus is rampant. We've got a little over 300 individuals that participate in our needle exchange. Scott Lockard is the district public health director. And of course, the ultimate goal is we try to get everyone into treatment because if a person participates in a syringe exchange program, research shows that they're five times more likely to go to treatment than individuals that don't. The program is anonymous. Participants give their initials and birth date for a registration card, but aren't asked to provide much more, syringes. except their used needles. So if they're injecting 12 times, they get 84 syringes. The exchange also provides other sterile drug equipment like tourniquets and cotton balls. In Louisville, Donald Davis mans this mobile exchange unit. We gave out 136,000 syringes and we got back 103. So that's very good return rate. What goes there? Jennifer Twyman has a post at the health department. A couple weeks ago, I had a 52-year-old man sitting in my chair crying because he didn't want to go to the hospital. Both on the front lines of the epidemic. We give them number of syringes that will last him a week according to the number of times they inject. And both in long-term recovery from drug addiction. I used to go and donate plasma every week, you know, and um, they called me in one day and told me that I couldn't donate anymore because I had FC. And then put them in, in the bag. 71-year-old Davis says he's now cured of the virus. Give them cookers. He encourages others to get in. tested and educates users Tourniquet, on how to prevent contracting Hep C. The majority of our people appreciate everything that we do. Not all feedback on the program is positive. A person can't recover if they're dead. So this is the logic that we give people when they say, well, you're enabling them. I guess I'm an enabler because I want to enable someone to be alive so they can get the treatment. Use alcohol wipe before. But these warriors say they won't give up. What does it mean to me to be able to do this? Everything. In Kentucky. It means everything. I'm Kristen Holmes reporting. Well, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services posted on their website Medicare would no longer pay for services after Wednesday at the Southeastern Kentucky Medical Center in Pineville. The post said the hospital did not meet several conditions of participation under the program's requirements. However, Pineville Mayor Scott Maiden says CMS decided to temporarily suspend the revocation of the Southeastern Kentucky Medical Center's licenses. This is the largest employer in our community and and not only that, but, you know, we, we need a hospital and uh, uh, we're going to do everything we can in our power to make sure that it, it stays open. Mayor Scott Maiden says they do not know at this time just how long the temporary suspension will last.
The Justice Department made a ruling that could make it easier for states to execute prisoners facing the death penalty. Earlier this month, the DOJ ruled the Food and Drug Administration does not have the authority to regulate drugs used to carry out the death penalty. The Justice Department says it does not make sense for the FDA to regulate such drugs as safe since they are used to kill people. The decision opens the door for states to import drugs used for lethal injections in death penalty cases. Well, many small towns in Kentucky are struggling not only with the state's drug epidemic, but they're also struggling to find people to work and grow the communities. 32 year old Somerset Mayor Alan Keck is now is new to the job, but is already bringing ideas the city has never tried before. Parts of Somerset sit on the shore of Lake Cumberland. Thousands visit the lake every summer weekend, but Mayor Keck says those visitors are not coming on land because they don't know what the city of Somerset can offer. I think that so often we struggle to tell the story of what we already have and that we focus, especially in Kentucky, on what we're not. And we have a tendency to apologize to folks for the things that we don't have instead of showcasing all that we do. The mayor is hoping these new ideas will help increase tourism in the area. What's well, 541 coming up? We will show you how one group is working to show the world what Eastern Kentucky as a whole has to offer. If you like heat and humidity, the next several days are for you. We have to deal with some scattered rain chances, though, too. I'll be talking about what we're expecting in about three minutes.